Up next, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, someone who's probably best described as uh, a thought leader in digital transformation, uh, who's been at uh, the management consultancy and IT services company uh, Capgemini for 14 years. Uh, he's going to be talking to us about turning technology into business transformation. Would you please give a very warm welcome to Dr. Cliff Evans. So, good afternoon. Um, I'm going to talk about some research we've uh, carried out over the last four years with the MIT on what makes digital mastery for large organizations. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about um, what that looks like in terms of definition and structure, and talk about how organizations engage when they're trying to roll out a digital transformation. I'm going to talk about what that means for the IT organization. I thought before we do that, though, I think. It's important to start with what do we actually mean uh, by digital? Um, I've asked that question um, to a lot of different audiences and got quite a variety of different answers. And since you seem to be quite participative in lots of uh, response earlier, I thought I'd try the question here then. So I'm looking for uh, three people to volunteer for me what they think the word digital means. Any volunteers? No? Go then. Ones and zeros, okay. Any, any, any raise taker? No paper. No paper, okay, it's good. Opportunity to look at fresh eyes and the way we do things. Okay, so I think they're all good and valid. I think, for me, I think the, the, one of the challenges is, is being clear that the, the digital is something that is moving very fast. And what it meant a couple of years ago could mean something very different a couple of years from now. And I'd just like you to look at this video, which give you, might give you something to think about. When I think about the future of digital transformation, there's an old story that I find very helpful. And it's a story about the inventor of the game of chess. The legend goes that the inventor took his creation to the emperor of India and showed him the game. And the emperor was so impressed by the beauty and elegance of the game of chess that he said, you can name your own reward. Majesty, I'm a humble man. All I want is a pile of rice. Put one grain of rice on the first square of this chessboard. Double that. Put two grains of rice on the second square. Double that. Continue on and on. And when we've got 64 squares full of rice, just give me that quantity of rice. And the emperor says, you really are a humble man. Make it so. Now, those of us who have had a little bit of math realize how much trouble the emperor is in because that constant doubling adds up over time and it reaches numbers that absolutely stagger the imagination. After 32 squares, there are a few billion grains of rice, which is a lot, but that's about as much as you would get from harvesting one large field. It's only when you get in the second half of the chessboard that things get really, really strange. So by the time they've covered 64 squares of the chessboard, there's a pile of rice bigger than Mount Everest, and it's more rice than has been produced by all of humanity in the entire history of the world. When the emperor realizes how badly he's been tricked by the inventor, he has the guy beheaded. He cuts off his head. So we did some quick calculations. The United States started tracking information technology as a category of corporate investment in about 1958. And if you take the normal doubling period of Moore's Law as 18 months, you take 32 of those doubling periods and you add that to 1958, it turns out that we entered the second half of the chessboard when it comes to digital technology in about 2006. So since 2006, we've seen the explosion of social media. We've seen the arrival of smartphones and tablets. We've seen computers that can now drive cars. We've seen humanoid robots in factories. We have seen a computer be the world champion in the quiz show Jeopardy. All these things have happened since 2006. So to me, that means that we are in some new phase. Maybe we have just started the second half of the chessboard when it comes to the power and the impact of digital technologies. And if what I've just said is true, if there's any truth to it, there's one conclusion. And that conclusion is 
we haven't seen anything yet. And I firmly believe that the digital innovations that are going to come and that are going to affect the business world are going to be absolutely transformative in the not too distant future. If that's the case, the only smart strategy at the top of the enterprise is again, to embrace and to start leading the digital transformation for your company. Cap Gemini Consulting, transform to the power of digital. So for me then, digital is not a thing. It's the enabling technology is disrupting the way businesses work and it's moving a lot more, a lot quicker than it used to. And it's gonna to continue to accelerate, as we can see from the basic mathematics of Moore's law and the ability of computers to process more information faster and faster. So what does that mean then for large organizations or organizations that have tried to embrace what, what the impact of digital technology will be? So there's six, is example six organizations here that are part of the research that we've carried out over the last four years. So we started with an initial survey of 15, 20 companies trying to define what we meant by digital mastery, then it expanded to about 400 companies, and then finally there's about 2,500 companies that have been invo involved in the work. So it's quite a comprehensive survey and not really looking at traditional industries. So you might have immediately gone to media or retail, so you know Burberry or a Starbucks with the, the cards. But actually if you look quite differently, so Cadelco is quite interesting, they're a mining company and they're using the technology to create the, the mine of mine where you won't have a miner in it. It will be all automated and it will all, all operate very differently. Now the interesting thing about that is as you get to that point, a lot of the constraints on mining at the moment are, are the fact that the size of the mine, how you get into it, are designed for human beings. So all of a sudden, if you think about the automation, you can think very differently about what the actual mine will become. And their journey started by automating these great big trucks that drive around the, the, uh, the sites, and then those trucks go to automation, the controls, and they're on a journey to automate the whole mining process. So when we think about digital, digital technology, we don't just think just about your social media analytics or your, your in-work in productivity. These are great parts of the equation, but we need to think very broadly about what technology can do, do for organizations. One of the things I'm most fascinated about at the moment is solar panels. I think, why solar panels? Is that digital? Well, it's the same technology. And if you look at it at the moment in California now, you're getting to a large number of people who are disconnecting from the grid. Now, what does that mean? It means that huge infrastructure industries, which power transmission networks, all of a sudden have redundant capital because they didn't predict the future where the future was says, actually, I no longer need this stuff piped to my home. I'm self-sufficient. So you can have a huge disruption to the utilities industry. And when we had the solar eclipse recently, there was quite a lot of worry about Germany because Germany has about 25%, something like that, quite a large amount of renewable energy. And there was a concern that would there be a blip. So this is not just for your hot local climates. Germany is quite, quite high in solar power. So think very broadly about what we mean by digital technology when we're thinking about transformation. So how do we define um, the framework? So we talk about firstly the what, as any an, a, 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 as a as a management consultant, unfortunately. So we all just have to have a two by two grid. So we're going to have to have a two by two grid. So we're going to have a, a capability in on one side and then the how on the other. And for a lot of our clients now, it's not really so much about the what. It's all about the how. The question is, how do I do that? How do I transform? What is it that I need to do? So if, when you look at the way that's the, way the analysis goes, we can look at the two different dimensions and we can say actually, as we go to the people who are, try a lot of things, they try a lot of things, but they're not so good at tr putting those things into practice, that you end up on that sort of top left-hand side and sort of term of a fashionista. So we all know them, these are the companies, lots of ideas, lots of incubators, but can you measure those incubators in a physical outcome of the company? Conservatives, these are people who try some stuff, but they're very good at the little bits they try, putting them into action. And then you have the digital masters, which are all about those who can do the innovative stuff with the control part of the process. Now, the important thing is, is, is to the previous presentation, it's, it's not just about how you do it, it's can we do it in such a way it's a measurable output? So can we measure the output of this impact on the organization? So what we can see from the analysis, if we compare these companies from the survey we've carried out and from their impact on the organization, you can see that um, top left-hand corner, try a lot of stuff, 
generate some good sales, but actually they're not, prof not, not that profitable because they're wasting a lot of energy. They're not converting those efforts into outputs. Look at the bottom right-hand corner. Not, the sales are lower, but profitability higher. And then the top right-hand corner, you can see that you've got a very measurable impact on the organization. So what this is saying that is you can, you can link the relationship between your, the way you use technology to innovate and your ability of, to turn those innovations into a fundamental business transformation into um, an outcome for the organization and measurable in terms of the profitability and revenue of the organization. So very distinct measurements, and you can see different characteristics by different sectors about where they are in that organization, and you can see how they're progressing. So it's very useful research if you want to see where am I in an industry, where do I want to go to, where are my peers in this sector. So in terms of what does that mean in terms of how the transformation looks for an organization, we can think of a number of areas. And I think when we think about digital a lot, we talk about, think about social media, analytics, commerce, um, cloud, and it tends to focus you on that customer experience front end. It's that website, it's the mobile, it's the social media. I think from our research, we're saying actually that's one part of the, part of the equation. But for a lot of organizations, as per the previous presentation, it's all about the operations. It's about the employee experience. It's about how you transform the organization, how you process digitization, how you enable workers, how you performance manage. So I think the relationship between customer experience and the operational transformation becomes more and more tightly knit. As you say, actually, I need to respond in my customer to real time, but if my organization can't deal with that response, then actually I can't keep up with the customer. So you end up with saying, actually, it's not just about customer experience, it's about the organization transformation as well. But the final part is, again, the, from the previous presentation, it was that you could one level think about digitizing the process, another level you can think completely laterally about how you operate and what the future is going to be. So we think about the idea of new business models. I've got a particular interest in the moment in um, cryptocurrencies and bitcoins and you say what are those well, I would I would really look at them quite quite as quite an interesting area and the Bank of England put a report out recently to to talk about them now you might dismiss bitcoin saying it's a cryptocurrency will it come along will it impact the really important thing is not the coinage it's the underlying technology is something called blockchain Blockchain is a completely different way of processing um, transactions and money on a distributed basis, which completely disrupts the model of banks. Because all of a sudden, instead of having centralized processing, you've got distributed payment processing. So the real thing to look at is don't focus on Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies. It's the underlying technology, which all the banks are now saying, oh dear, this could completely destroy my business model because it's a very different way of processing. So I think thinking differently about the business model as an alternative is, is one thing a lot of companies are now having to deal with. So if you come to the, the point that we talked about what is digital mastery, what is digital transformation, the next question you say is, how do I go on that journey? How do I transform my organization? And again, part of the challenge is we always leap to the technology. So I'm going to use this bit of technology. I'm going to do some stuff. And magic will happen to my organization. Um, fact is, that's not the case. That doesn't happen. So our work says that actually you need to embrace four different areas. One is you need to engage in the vision at an executive level. You need to be top down. Ultimately, you can try lots of stuff, but unless it's understood in the transformative effect of the technology at the top of the office, then it's just not, never going to happen. You've got to engage the organization. And we had a couple of interesting quotes earlier. Uh, around the John F. Kennedy uh, discussion. You've got to engage the organization around the vision. And then we're going to talk about, then how do you govern the transformation? And then you've got to engage IT and technology together. So there's four areas in the round we need to think about. Now, I think the important thing is, it's very easy. I could talk a lot about technology, but I'm not. I'm going to talk about the difficult bit, which is about engaging the organization. So one of the interesting questions for me around, and one, one, one of the definitions I had in a previous presentation I gave is somebody said, oh, digital is just a rebranding of dot-com when dot-com was around. Well, so those of you who went into a dot-com uh, business in 2001, what did you find? You had to have a 
foosball table. If you had a foosball table, you were a cool business, you, you were dot com, that was it, you're all good. You had, you had no ceilings as well. You had to have um, bare ceilings, you had to see the rafters and that sort of stuff. Now, it seems to me that I've been into a couple of banks recently, and when you go into this big tower, 30 floors, and you, you know that you're on the digital floor. Do you know why you're on the digital floor? They've got a foosball table. I mean, that's it. They've defined digital as the foosball table. Now, I think the thing is, it should be a table tennis table. I mean, table tennis is cooler now than foosballs, but that's it. That's their definition. I think they've missed the point a bit. So the next idea is, oh, I'll employ lots of millennials, lots of Gen X, Gen Y people, and magic will happen. You know, we'll, we'll get all these sorts of things and all sorts of stuff will happen. Um, again, lesson from the research is, you need to have the right mix of skills, right mix of staff, mix of people, but actually still need the vision and the leadership to embrace and make sure everyone engages around those ideas. So the other idea is I need to be creative. I need to have my mad men in the office. I need to have be wild. I need to have goatees and stuff like that. So and that's the old view, wasn't it? I think this is the way you look now. So you have to have the cool dudes, all from San Francisco. They've got to be hanging around. And, it, and all magic's going to happen. Again, you can't, ma you can't change everyone overnight, so it's not going to happen. So it might work for a startup, but if you're a large organization, you can't suddenly, uh, by putting a few people badly dressed in the office, magic's not going to happen. So I come to the idea of a cookie. So why a cookie? Because I think it embodies to me what, what this is all about. This is actually, so the good example is uh, Super Bowl. Um, and I'm sure a number of you know this story. So Super Bowl lights go out a couple of years ago and Oreos, somebody puts a, a social media piece out saying actually now's the time to dunk your Oreos. Huge coverage for Oreos cookies, uh, more valuable than the advertising that was planned for that Super Bowl in terms of coverage and brand coverage. So, so the key for me is to look then at how the differences were. So previously, if you think about Super Bowl, you have all these mad men planning months and I'm going to book my million dollars a second advertising and I'm going to prepare, prepare, prepare. I'm going to process and I'm going to launch this ad and, it's going to, and I bought that space. In the, in the new world though, you, then that world you didn't really empower anyone because you planned it all. In the new world you've empowered somebody organizationally to represent your brand in real time in response to an incident and they've had a great effect. Now that's a huge change in culture because all of a sudden I previously empowered my brand to make months and months of planning and a big launch. I'm now going to empower people in my organization to communicate directly outside and, and, and magic can happen. Now we all know there's upsides and downsides to social media in terms of brand presence and brand enlightenment. But I think it does illustrate that in this case, this was not about the technology at all. It was about how the organization had restructured itself and empowered individuals in the organization to represent the brand um, at any given point in time. And that's what we need to think about when we're thinking about the engagement models for, for a digital transformation. So if you think about that model, and Here's three examples that we've uh, looked at through the book and uh, through the analysis we've carried out. And I think the really interesting one is, is Pernod Ricard. So Pernod Ricard, um, a lot of um, the drinks companies are very uh, federal, very globally distributed because uh, a lot of drinks brands are manufactured locally, they're sold locally. So Saab Miller is another example, which means if you want to... Um, transform the organization, you have to connect to everyone at the local level. You have to get them all being engaged. You have to get them all thinking about this transformation that you're trying to create. So Pernod Ricard recognized that, and they set about a model which was to engage everyone in the organization around the world, to engage them in the process, to use social media internally, to use blogging and other processes to have, actually have a very tangible effect on how everyone in, was was a line behind the overall vision for technology that they had. And this process took a couple of years, but they've actually now been very effective in that model, and they have a, a, a tremendous impact on the brand globally through that management and mobilization of, a, of approach. So it's a good example of how you can engage a federal organization. And even in uh, thinking about, about Wales, 
you have lots of local communities, and therefore I wouldn't uh, go away from the idea of looking at some of these large corporations and how they deal with federal, federal deployments. If you take Coca-Cola, they were more around um, champions. They were more about employing different champions in part of the organization, centers of excellence, driving, driving particular focus in areas. And um, Coke is slightly different because it's much more centrally brand driven. So whilst uh, Pernod Ricard relies on local brands, Coke is very centrally brand driven and actually has to promulgate ideas out and then get the people to buy into those ideas. So having local digital champions, bringing those back into the center, uh, cause tremendous, you know, tremendous in terms of the deployment of the approach. Um, EMC is a final example. There is about deploying an innovation model, about how to have outside innovation coming into the organization. And I've seen the similar sort of model with um, some pharmaceutical companies where they say, actually, I need to sort of capture ideas of innovation around the organization, identify them, bring them back into the center, farm them out and recycle them, and make sure everyone buys into it. So it's a way of capturing outside in, back into the organization, rather than driving things outside, inside out. So I bring these examples up because I think if we think about business transformation enabled by technology, which is, which is where we are in terms of creating the digital mastery as an overall model, then you end up with thinking, have to think much more deeply about how you engage the people in the organization and how you change the way they think and they operate. So it leads us to the third topic then, which is around what do we mean in terms of the, the IT function? So if we've got our, our vision, we've talked about, we've talked a lot about engagement, but actually then they say come around to technology leadership. How does the technology function now have to respond to the, to the, uh, to the, to the focus that's put upon it? And you get to this interesting debate now around the role of the, uh, the CIO and how the CIO interacts with organizations. Um, so in government, there's clearly a focus now on splitting the CIO and the CTO and the CDO, and there is this new title called CDO, that uh, uh, Chief Digital Officer that a lot of organizations have adopted, really to emphasize the bridge between technology and business. And in a lot of organizations, the Chief Digital Officer tends to sit as a business side role rather than a technology side role, not reporting to the CIO. And the question is, do CIOs become CDOs or do you replace the CIO? It's an interesting debate. Um, I think for us, when we looked at it, we could see three areas where you could see uh, a real impact on the way organizations uh, need to embrace technology and their technology function. So the first one was around new business relationships between technology and IT. Um, it was about having cl much closer relationships because we all understand iterative, agile ways of working, how that needs to operate. And in this new world, there needs to be much closer working between the IT and the business function. I had a workshop recently with, it, with an organization and the business led the discussion on technology all, all the way through. The executive of the organization was very clear on what digital meant. Um, and I thought it was going quite swimmingly. The CIO contributed during the sessions till we got to a session in the afternoon. Uh, and he basically, s sort of about halfway through, he said, we, we, talking about the technology function, have come up with some great ideas. We're just waiting for you, the business, to implement it. And I thought, oh dear, uh, that hasn't quite worked. He's not quite got the plot here, which is about doing it iteratively. The response from the chief executive was, I think we're supposed to be doing this iteratively together. So I think the interesting debate here is that I think the business in a lot of organizations gets it more than the technology function. And the technology function has to wake up and engage in the debate more effectively. And part of that is building the right digital skills in, in the technology organization. That's technology people who have business skills and business skills people who are educated with the technology. And I, I like to think about it as the technology organization being able enabled to engage in a conversation with a um, not tell me what you're after, I'm going to give you this technology. It's a question of, did you know you could do that? And I think technology is a lot about that today. It's saying to the business, did you know you could do that? Oh yes, I now understand the opportunity. Let's work on the opportunity together. And then the final part of the equation is then the digital platform. Have I got right tools? And when I talk about platform, I don't mean a physical thing. I mean more of an orchestration of services, how the bits and pieces connect together as an overall model. Now, if you wrap all those pieces up, you come to this debate around two-speed IT or multi-speed IT. Gartner frames it as two-speed IT. 
And there's a bit of an argument there, but can I suddenly magically make all of my IT department digital, or do I have to have one part of it moving at one pace, another part moving at another pace? And I guess the lesson from a lot of the conversations I've been having is you can't suddenly create digital people from people who've run a mainframe for the last 10 years and don't want to be a digital person. So part of it is about, and I think one of the benefits of the multi-speed IT department conversation is it, people can move at different paces as the technology does, people can get upskilled at different paces, and you can transform in different ways. So I think part of the di discussion around the skills within the IT function is finding things that people are comfortable with and moving them along at the right pace for those different skill sets. So that leads you to a number of areas of thinking in terms of how you can look at the different um, skills you need within the IT function. It's about, I think the, the idea of ecosystem partnerships works well, and number, there's a number of sessions here talking about SMEs, how you engage different organizations, how you bring different ideas into the, into the debate. So I think the use of ecosystems is an important part of a new world for IT functions. It's about in, using different recruitment methods, employing people from different backgrounds in different areas. I mean, training is clearly a key area in terms of the way it operates, and uh, Intel is a great example of that in terms of its IQ training program. And then finally about incubating, there is having the incubator model, having people who try stuff, how you promulgate the trying stuff around organizations becomes a quite, a, quite, a, a, quite a part of the debate in terms of how you operate. I think the important thing, though, is that for a lot of IT functions, one forgets this is a core plank of the, the piece. One worries again about the technology, about the frameworks, about the architectures, about the infrastructure, about the choice of platforms, about the use of cloud. But at the end of the day, those pieces have to be put together by people. And if you don't have the people with the right skills who can embrace the technology, transform it, who can work with the business iteratively and build trust, then you're not going to actually get the benefits of that technology in the way you implement as a different operating model. So I think thinking as much around the people as the technology, even within the IT function, becomes a key part of the transformational, transformational argument. So we've talked about what makes a digital master. We've talked about how you transform and how you engage the organization, and talk a bit about then what that means for the technology function. So if you think about putting that and wrapping up, yeah, I think what our research has showed is that there's a key part of the what. You know, what, is, what does it mean? What does digital tra transformation mean? It's about putting the consumers at the heart. But it's not just about the customer experience. It's about the value chain. It's about the digital operations as much as the customer experience. It's about underpinning it with data. Data becomes a thing that enables you to drive the transformation, both internally and externally. And also, it's about bringing ideas from outside the organization as well as from inside the organization. So it's not just about driving innovation internally. The how is, is going to be about, has to be led from the top. You need to have the right governance framework. But, the, but more importantly from those two, I think, is a bit that we all forget. It's about engaging the organization behind the vision and the governance. You can have a great vision, great governance, but unless you engage the organization behind the ideas, and that, if anything, is the really soft, difficult bit that you have to try and get right. And then you need to try experimenting and scaling. So we need to move to a test and learn environment. We need to be able to scale then quickly once you've created that innovation. And you need to be able to connect people together to, to, to between the two and have the right capabilities. So I think hopefully we've looked at that what and the how together. It's made you think about what does that mean for my organization, but more importantly, what are the skills I need to create a digital transformation? That's it, thank you. Thank you.